We continue now from our last video looking at this amazing tunnel that was built in the late 1800s between Port Chern and Sarnia, the St. Clair Tunnel. First, let's look at the, some of the men that were instrumental in the success of this tunnel. Sir Henry Tyler was president of the Grand Trunk Railway, and he was an early and persistent proponent of a tunnel under the St. Clair River. It's worth noting that he was the chairman of a commission that endorsed the construction of a tunnel connecting England and France across the Straits of Dover in 1874. Of course, that tunnel failed to materialize. As early as November of 1879, Tyler instructed Sir Joseph Higgins, the Grand Trunk's general manager, to investigate alternative ways to cross the St. Clair River. You must note that uh, Mr. Tyler sent Mr. Hickson, uh, dated November 18, 1879. He says this, When shall we be in running order to Chicago? As soon as the route is, if it become a proved success, we shall have seriously to consider the question of a tunnel at Sarnia, or a tube at the bottom of the St. Clair River, perhaps slightly below the bottom, work from a heading with a watertight face. In this next note, you can see there was some dissension among the ranks. Some folks thought that the bridge was the best way to go, and others thought that the bridge was uh, not a good way to go, and some didn't think the tunnel was a good way to go. In Hickson's response, uh, going back to uh, Mr. Tyler, he was in uh, consultation with somebody by the name of Hannaford, and they also include part of his uh, note here as well. He says this, I doubt very much if any bridges will ever be put across either the Detroit or the St. Clair rivers. The shipping in these waters is immense, and the shipping interest extremely powerful in the state of Michigan. The difficulties in the way of sinking tubes are certainly quite as great as Mr. Hannaford describes them. In a letter dated January 7th, 1880, Hannaford stated that the physical difficulties were such as to place a tunnel practically out of the question and that if a crossing was ever required other than the car ferry, a bridge would be the practical and least costly way. They couldn't continue the way they were. The ferries are very expensive to run. They're running 24-7. And the increase in business and uh, the number of cars going across, they couldn't handle anymore. So that just left two ways, the bridge and the tunnel. The surrounding country is very level and it would be almost impossible to build a bridge of a height sufficient to give a free and uninterrupted passage to vessels underneath. A swinging bridge was out of the question as hundreds of craft of all descriptions passed through the river daily. All these questions were considered, and it was decided to take the other horn of the dilemma, the tunnel. In February of 1883, Hickson hired Montreal engineer Walter Shanley to do a feasibility study for a tunnel under the river. Walter Shanley, with the help of his brother Francis, had taken over the stalled Hussack Tunnel a project in northern Massachusetts in late 1868, and in 1874 completed this five mile long railroad tunnel. Shanley did not conduct any engineering studies of the St. Clair River area, but he nevertheless suggested that the Grand Trunk built a tunnel south of Port Huron in Sarnia, about three miles south of the ferry crossing. Tyler, Hickson, and Walter Shanley considered several means of crossing the St. Clair River before deciding to bore a tunnel under the riverbed. A bridge with long gradual approaches would cost at least five million dollars and would face vehement opposition from the U.S. shipping interests. Hickson asked Shanley to consider a trench and tube tunnel where they would sink an iron tube in a trench excavated in the river bottom. And this is what they would do in Detroit many years later. And we uh, looked at this in a previous video where the reed tug was pulling that tubing. Shanley argued that a trench and tube design would also bring strong opposition from navigation interests, who would complain that construction would likely interfere with shipping. He believed that he could drive a tunnel through the clay under the river uh, three miles south of Lake Huron for about $2 million using standard tunneling methods. In mid-November 1884, seven months after being named chief engineer of the tunnel project, Joseph Hobson sent Hickson a 22-page letter endorsing the route and tunnel design suggested by Shanley. Hobson believed that the tunnel was technically feasible and that improved knowledge of tunneling 
would enable the Grand Trunk to solve any problems it might encounter. You ever wonder why the tunnel wasn't built in Detroit? Well, years before the St. Clair Tunnel was built, they tried to build the tunnel in Detroit. The tunnel attempt uh, beneath the Detroit River was made by the Michigan Central Railroad in 1872. After construction of 1,220 feet on the U.S. side and 450 feet on the Canadian side, the tunnel was abandoned due to high water pressures and the presence of deadly sulfur gas. Keeping this in mind, Hobson understandably proceeded with caution in planning the tunnel under the St. Clair River. Both river bottoms consisted of similar soft blue clay, therefore the dangers that they faced would also be similar. Tunnels have been built for centuries, uh, start off uh, with the mining tunnels, and then of course as the railroad industry grew, uh, tunnels through mountains were getting to be quite common much easier to go through a mountain as to go miles and miles around a mountain. And so uh, when it comes to that type of uh, tunneling, compared to underwater tunneling, there's no comparison. The hard rock tunneling was originally done with picks, and then uh, eventually they used drills. Then they realized they could just drill holes and put dynamite in it and just blow it one big section at a time. And soft ground tunneling is completely different. Here you're digging through clay, and clay, of course, as you dig through it, can collapse very easily. And it's also soaked with water. You have a saturation in clay. As you're digging through that clay, uh, there's always a chance to collapse, and on top of that, the water is always coming down on top of you through the clay. So it's very dangerous. And as you can see from this picture here, there is rock underneath the St. Clair River, but it's too deep. The incline would be too great if he went below the clay. So they had to drill through the clay. This photograph gives you some idea of what they were digging through. I've heard some people say that the St. Clair Tunnel was the first tunnel built underwater in the world. Really, the truth of the matter is that it was the first tunnel built underwater in North America. The first underwater tunnel built in the world was built in London, England, and under the Thames River. This was a very unique tunnel. It wasn't a real tunnel at all. It was made for pedestrians, and uh, originally they thought uh, horses and carriages could go through it as well. And they could have, except they ran out of money for the ramps, and they never did put the ramps in. So mainly it was a pedestrian tunnel and became a tourist attraction. And so people would pay their chilling and go on through the tunnel. Many never walking all the way through because they were just too scared. But they could say they were in the tunnel. It appears to be two separate tunnels, but in reality it's, it's one tunnel. It's about 35 feet uh, wide. And uh, the reason it looks like two is because of the opening there. But if you look inside here in this photograph here, you can see the open arches between the two sides. The tunnel was used to host parties and uh, fundraisers and even fairs. Uh, they had acrobats, they had uh, trained animals, fire eaters, a little bit of everything. It was a difficult tunnel to build. It took 18 years to finish it. It was flooded multiple times while they were working on it. But in spite of all the problems, this man persevered. His name was Mark Brunel. And he is the reason I'm spending some time on this tunnel. Because without him, chances are there wouldn't have been a St. Clair tunnel. For now, employed an entirely novel apparatus of his own invention to provide continuous and reliable support of the soft water bearing clay which formed the riverbed. By means of this shield, Bernal was able to drive the world's first underwater tunnel. The shield was of cast iron, rectangular in elevation, and was propelled forward by jack screws. Shelves at top, bottom, and sides supported the tunnel roof, floor, and walls until the permanent brick lining was placed. The working face, the critical area, was supported by a large number of small resting boards held against the ground by small individual screws bearing against the shield framework. The shield itself was formed of 12 separate frames, each of which could be advanced independently of the others. The height was 22 feet, the width 37. 
A shield could be built uh, depending on the size of the tunnel. They could add extra cages to it. This uh, particular shield here has 18 different cages. And notice each cage has a worker in it. And that worker would be uh, digging out the clay. This is a method of tunneling that was done in the St. Clair Tunnel with the shield. Although well, the shield wasn't exactly like this, there were some improvements on it. And we'll look at that in a minute. And this uh, unique uh, souvenir plate of the Thames River Tunnel, you can see they uh, paid homage to uh, Brunel's uh, shield because inside these two uh, openings, you can see the workers working in their shields, each one in their own cage, working to get that uh, clay out of the tunnel. Over the years, uh, improvements were made to the Brunel shield. Peter William Barlow patented a round tunnel shield in 1864. And then his understudy, James Henry Greathead, uh, in turn used a version of Barlow's shield in building a second Thames tunnel, the Tower Subway, completed in 1869. Greathead's use of a cast iron lining in the Tower Subway was a major breakthrough that allowed him to complete the project in less than a year. Up until this point, all the shields were driven by the screw jacks, and all the inventors had been European. And along comes Alfred Beach, an American. He invented a shield that uh, was similar to great heads, I mean it was round, but uh, the big difference was instead of the old screw jacks, he had uh, pneumatic jacks, so uh, this made it much easier on the workers. In this picture on the left, you can see the blades uh, going out into the clay. These blades were sharpened. You didn't have the spikes like you had at the Brunel shield. But you had these blades that would cut into uh, the clay. And then behind the blades, you had the uh, platforms where the workers would stand and dig it out. James Greathead later combined all these advances and used compressed air and engineering the London subway tunnel built in 1886. Greathead system with only minor modifications made by Hobson for the St. Clair Tunnel has remained to this day the basic technique for driving tunnels in soft ground. The only notable change in technology over the past century is to use a mechanical digging machinery instead of hand labor for the removal of material. Once Hobson had decided to use a tunnel shield, he designed one which resembled those built by Beach and Greathead. Hamilton Bridge and Tool Company of Hamilton, Ontario built both tunnel shields. And the Hamilton firm shipped the shields to Sarnia and Port Erin in pieces, and then assembled them. The reason for that was the size and the weight. The shield weighed 80 ton. And here you can see the assembled shield. This is the one that the St. Clair Tunnel used. Join me in our next video to see how they constructed this amazing tunnel underneath the St. Clair River.